<clears throat> Welcome to the 12th annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. My name is Hillel Neuer. I'm the Executive Director of United Nations Watch. On behalf of our 25 NGO co-sponsors, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome all of you to this important gathering of human rights dissidents, human rights defenders, families of political prisoners, and advocates for human rights and freedom around the world. I want to thank all of our partners, NGOs, who have contributed immensely to enabling us to gather courageous champions of human rights from all corners of the globe. And we meet on an important occasion. As Ambassador Alfred Moses will mention a little bit today and at more, greater length tomorrow, we now begin the 75th anniversary of the United Nations Charter when after World War II, nations met, assembled to envision a world quote, in larger freedom, to reaffirm faith and fundamental human rights. And we also meet on the occasion only days before, seven days before, foreign ministers from around the globe will gather in this building to open the 2020 session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. That council was created 14 years ago in March of 2006 in Resolution 60-251 as part of an attempt to reform what was considered the failed Commission on Human Rights, and with the aim of creating a new and improved Human Rights Council, as Kofi Annan envisioned it, that would have member states who were there not to shield their abuses of their own and those of their allies, but rather to promote and protect human rights. He called for a council that would be made up of members who meet the highest standards of human rights, and that is enshrined in the resolution. Council members must must uphold the highest standards, shall uphold the highest standards of human rights. And as you'll hear shortly afterwards from Ambassador Diego Aria, we have reason to ask whether all members are meeting those standards and whether we may need to invoke uh, the provision of the Human Rights Council Charter, which calls for suspending, for removing a council member that commits gross and systematic abuses of human rights. And indeed, as the Council will meet next week for a four-week session, it will address many topics, and some of the situations that are represented here will be addressed, but regrettably, many, too many, will be neglected. Too many of the urgent situations represented here will not be addressed at all, and some of them will be addressed, but only <clears throat> marginally. For example, we will hear later from Juher Ilham, the daughter of Uyghur scholar Ilham Toti, a political prisoner in China. China has over one billion people. It has one-fifth of the world's population. To date, in the 14 years of the Council, there has not been one resolution for human rights victims in China, not one resolution for the Uyghurs, who, the estimates we'll hear more later, one million or more Uyghur Muslims are locked up in camps in China. There's not been one resolution, there's not been one urgent session, there's not been one commission of inquiry. Sadly, on the contrary, in this past summer, this document was published by the Human Rights Council, A slash HRC 41 slash G slash 17. This is a letter dated 12 July 2019 from 50 ambassadors here in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. And the letter goes on. See all the countries listed here. We have Bangladesh, Belarus, Bolivia, Burundi, Congo, Cuba, North Korea, Egypt, Eritrea. The list goes on. Praising China for its treatment of the Uyghurs. Praising China for what it calls fighting terrorism. We appreciate, I'm quoting, we appreciate China's commitment to openness and transparency. Well, about the coronavirus, I think you know about China's commitment to openness and transparency. China has invited diplomats and organization officials to Xinjiang to witness the progress of the human rights cause and the outcomes of counterterrorism and de-radicalization there. So it's a, it's a letter talking about uh, how China sets up vocational education and is respecting, and I quote, the fundamental human rights of people of all ethnic groups uh, in order to promote 
what they call a, quote, stronger sense of happiness, fulfillment, and security. So 50 ambassadors of the Human Rights Council have published this as an official letter. So we decided that it was important to hear Juher Ilham to hear a different part of the story, and I would say perhaps the, truth, the true side of the story. <clears throat> and I hope that the world leaders will pay attention when they hear her today and tomorrow. And there has never been a resolution for human rights victims in Vietnam. And we have here Dennis Chow. Where's Dennis? Dennis Chow, we'll hear from him shortly about his father, Van Camp Chow, who went back. He was living in Australia in safety, but because of his commitment to freedom and the cause of human rights in Vietnam, he went back and was arrested and is now in prison, arbitrarily a political prisoner. And of course, sadly, we meet once again, and our friend, the Saudi blogger, Raif Badawi remains in prison in a very difficult situation. We'll hear more about that. Saudi Arabia has been a member every time of the Human Rights Council elected repeatedly. This year they have to go off because of term limits, but every time they're elected for three years and three years again and again and again, and there's never been a resolution for <clears throat> human rights activists thrown into prison like Raif Badawi and others, and we'll hear about that from Dr. Elham Manea. And we have Biram Da'abeid from Mauritania, who's leading the fight against slavery in Mauritania. Sadly, one month ago, Mauritania, a country where, according to CNN and The Guardian, is, quote, the last bastion of slavery. 100,000 to 500,000 slaves in Mauritania. That regime was just elected as a new member of the Human Rights Council, in defiance of the criteria which requires that they consider their record on promoting and protecting human rights. And so we'll hear from Biram Da Abid, who's gone to prison several times to fight against slavery, uh, risking his own freedom for this cause. And Iran, a country that is addressed somewhat with a rapporteur uh, here at the Human Rights Council, but the resolution is short, and as Sweden, the sponsor, calls it short and procedural. Sadly, at the United Nations, Iran last year was elected as a judge on the Women's Rights Commission, uh, to judge women's rights complaints. And that's why we thought we needed to hear from Shaparak Shaja Rizadeh, an Iranian women's rights activist who sacrificed her freedom repeatedly, daring to remove her headscarf in defiance of the compulsory hijab law in Iran. And she was repeatedly jailed, arrested, beaten, brutalized, and she managed to escape. Now lives in Canada, was named by the BBC rightfully as one of the top 100 inspiring and influential women around the world. And we have from Malawi, Memory Banda, who leads Malawi's fight to end child marriage through her work. And that's an issue that's not addressed sufficiently, the issue of child marriage. It's happening in Malawi, but in other countries as well. And we look forward to putting a spotlight on that. Qatar is a member of the Human Rights Council and we never hear about the slavery, if you want to call it that, forced labor uh, that is taking place there to build buildings for the World Cup and other places. And we will hear from Peter Patterson about that tomorrow. Um, we also have from Pakistan, now living in Canada, Peter Bhatti, Pakistan is a member of the Human Rights Council. There's never been one resolution, one urgent session, one commission of inquiry on Pakistan. And we have Peter Bhatti, his brother, Shabazz Bhatti, was the minister in charge of protecting minorities. He dared to speak out for people like Asya Bibi, Christian mother of five, convicted for blasphemy, was on death row for years. And Shabazz Bhatti went spoke out. He was in Canada. Professor Kotler was telling me moments ago about how people warned him, if you go back to Pakistan, there were threats against you. And we'll see a video tomorrow. He knew about the threats against his life, but he said, I must go back to my people. I must go back to my country and speak out. And he paid for it with his life. And his brother is here. We'll hear about the situation of minorities there in Pakistan. We have with us Lyubov Sobol, uh, who will speak to us tomorrow about human rights in Russia. She is a uh, leading Russian anti-corruption activist known as today's opposition leader in Russia. She's been arrested many times, has over a million followers on YouTube, and we'll hear from her tomorrow about Russia. We have Rebecca Kabuo from the Democratic Republic of Congo, who will talk to us about 
situation there. She was one of the youngest prisoners of conscience in the world. Democratic Republic of Congo is a member of the Human Rights Council. And finally, we will hear from Professor Erwin Kotler, who is the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and give us some perspective on where we go from here. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, invite Ambassador Alfred Moses to deliver opening remarks, and then I will give the floor to Ambassador Diego Aria.